the Healthy Landscapes program um, more or less looks at ecosystem-based principles and how they might be used to create uh, innovative solutions for all land management, not just forestry, not just governments, but all land management. Now, for these talks, I always have to, I mean, I was cognizant of Gord launching right in and not having to explain to anyone why a grizzly bear was important and or why a caribou was important for the talks to come. Um, I am going to spend some time talking about ecosystems because when you talk about an ecosystem, um, it, you don't get a pretty picture of it and people go, okay, ecosystems. So I'm going to spend the first part of it talking about why we are the, uh, the Healthy Landscapes program. Um, and I'll preface that by saying that we started out with three partners in the foothills and we've got over 20 now in five different provinces and territories. Um, and that's because the interest in this has been sort of snowballing, especially lately. So I'm going to start out with the why. And the why is because we manage pieces. That's what we do. That's how we have approached all of our land management, all of our natural resource management, not even forest land management, aquatic systems, um, everything we manage in pieces. This is this is an aerial shot, my best shot at an, at an ecosystem. And I think we all agree this is what we're after, right? This is, this is what we're all focusing on here. But in fact, what happens is that we get pieces. So maybe down in the bottom corner there, down in the bottom left-hand corner, maybe this is a national park. And maybe the other two are, you know, a provincial park and a township um, or, you know, an, uh, or, or a city or something. Um, and then, you know, there's uh, FMAs and we tend to think of forest management areas as being areas, well, there's a tenure holder, they're responsible for it. That's not true. The forest management companies are actually managing the upland part of the land base. What you're look, depending on what part of the province or the, or, or the country you're in, that whole lowland, the wetlands, nobody's managing those. They don't have the mandate to do it. Um, and they're really, they don't have a, a, a target. Okay? And then of course there's the smaller pieces that might represent, you know, oil and gas uh, mining, um, mining companies. And when you put them all together, this is sort of what overlapping tenure looks like, right? So we're just managing in pieces and there is no big picture. And that idea of managing piece in pieces carries over into how we approach it. It's, that's how we do science, right? We, we study individual species, grizzly bear, caribou, bull trout, um, individual values, recreation, access. Um, and even the, the, the classic three-circle model of sustainability, you put your values into the middle, into the pot, and you balance them, right? Uh, of, uh, we look at the program today, and of the first eight talks, seven of them are about individual pieces and values, right? It's, it's how we approach management. Even the management tools that we have, the scenario planning tools, the habitat tools, they're all about pieces, policies and practices. Another piece that I want to talk about um, that is relevant is that we tend to think of a landscape or an ecosystem as in, in, at a place in time as being a piece as well. And I wanted to just give you a sense of how dynamic these landscapes are. This is the Alberta Pacific FMA. Um, and the next 10 slides I'm going to show you are just going to go in a sequence of 10 year increments of, of a simulation model. The red are going to be disturbances the dark green are going to be old forest, okay? So there's in 10 year increments and keep your eye on how much red there is and where the dark green is. The idea is this is what a dynamic landscape means. This is how mother nature moves old growth around in time and space and this is how important disturbance is to these landscapes, okay? Disturbance is an absolute fundamental need for these landscapes. And, and another piece that I've seen now and coming out is are things called disturbance thresholds, which in my world is pretty disturbing because disturbance is a really good thing. There's lots of studies out there that will demonstrate that actually the biodiversity of a boreal forest within the first five years after a fire is higher than old forest. It's higher. It's, it's completely different. It's not the, the beautiful old forest that we're used to, but it's still an important part of the ecosystem. So, in summary of the why, what we're moving to here philosophically are some fundamental changes from 
you know, not that long ago, and even in the paper now and in scientific literature, we're still talking about disturbance and wildfires as being catastrophic and as being bad. And we, we're going to make that shift over in my world of looking at ecosystems to recognizing that that's a fundamental piece. Um, we think now, even through our, through our actions, that we can manage ecosystems by pieces. And by that, I'm not trying to say that what Gord is doing or what you know, the Caribou Research is doing is irrelevant. Absolutely not. Okay? These two things have to work together. But the risk that we're taking here is assuming that if we manage by the pieces, we're going to look after the ecosystem. And that's not necessarily the case. And also, this idea of landscapes being stable and predictable and you know, caught in time. They're dynamic, they move around, and we better respect that. So, now we'll move on to the what of the program, finally. And I realize this is the wrong crowd for showing a forest management uh, example here, but let's just, uh, this is just to get you going here. So, forest management has been one of the first to pick up on it. Um, in North America, at least, not in other parts of the world. Um, and this is an example of, of uh, about 15 years ago of how we started applying it. And this is one township in Saskatchewan, just south of the Air Weapons Range, um, with Mystic Management. And on the left is uh, their original version of how they were going to do harvesting. Classic two-pass, the road system goes in, you leave it in for 15 to 20 years, there's a green up, you come back, you take it out. On the right, is the one that I would call a natural pattern inspired disturbance plan. And that, in other words, based on the research that we've done, and I won't bore you with all of the, the details, um, that's what a forest fire looks like. That's what it leaves behind in terms of residuals, and it happens fast, and you get in and you get out. And so in this case, they've gone from having you know, 122 kilometers of roads that are going to stay in there for 20 years to five kilometers of roads, most of which is actually gone now. Um, the studies that have been done on this and any others that have looked at the biodiversity values have very clearly demonstrated that this works. And that's what it looks like today. We flew over it uh, about two months ago with some uh, people from UBC. It was harvested 15 years ago. We had to tell people it was a harvest block. They didn't know. So, that's not the real world and it's not your world, right? This. This is what we have as uh, most of uh, a large part of the landscapes out there, and these are the ones that we're dealing with in real life. This is a result of our puzzle pieces, and this is um, uh, the white cord area. And again, from my perspective, when I take a look at this as an ecosystem, the problem is not disturbance per se. That's pro the probably in terms of percentage, that's a very low percentage compared to what Mother Nature would have done. The problem is how it's distributed, the severity, the timing, the spacing, all of those things. So what can we do about that? Well, here's, here's the Swan Hills fire um, before and after. Before on the left and after on the right. And the, the message here to me is that once that fire went through, it essentially erased the cultural footprint that was underneath it. Okay? That's, that fire was essentially, for all intents and purposes, a restoration activity on top of it. So we've got the idea that can we take a landscape that has been culturally modified, even severely so, and overlay a, a more of a natural footprint on top of it? The idea would be that, of course, here on top, all of those areas in green would be islands, and they can be arranged in such a way that from, for SAG D and directional drilling, they could be, we're going to leave all the islands. Together as a team, as a group, we're going to plan collaboratively, and those islands stay. Everywhere else, forestry comes in, takes the wood, we erase all of that linear cultural footprint underneath it, and we start that landscape, or that piece of the landscape over. Now, we'll step back one scale, and now we can start to take a look at where the pieces are on the landscape where we can put disturb, cultural disturbance activities, and those would be areas where there's forest that's available to be harvested, where there's existing installations, and you know you're going to be over the next 10, 20 years. Okay? And then identify areas where there are candidates where you don't have to be, and we call those wares and wins. And this is exactly how Mother Nature works on the landscape. The problem, again, is not disturbance, it's where it is and when it is. And the idea is that the wares and the winds alternate on the landscape over time. 
Nothing stays constant. So this has achieved several things. Forestry has become a tool with which to restore landscapes. Um, there's a, a collaboration here that actually moving a landscape back into a natural condition and everyone who's involved takes credit for that. Um, and it also suggests that for those areas where disturbance activities would occur, that we'd be reducing things like fire threat where there are values at risk like installation facilities. So we've actually, we're actually trying this right now. Um, just south of Fort McMurray, there's a study area called the Stony 800 um, pilot area. It's about 330,000 hectares. And I've just mocked it up here. Uh, roads in yellow, uh, blue would be seismic lines, green would be harvest areas existing. And the, and the question we asked here is, can we create, can we use natural pattern inspired disturbance activities to create uh, on a culturally modified landscape to bring it back to being more natural. And so the idea here is that we create a scoring system to create the wares and the winds. The wares we would get directly from Mother Nature. We know how often, even at this scale, at any one period in time, you're going to get disturbance activities. And again, the idea here is that the, the winds are not, you have to stay out of them. Those are your potential old forest caribou habitats. They may not all survive, but the idea is that you would redo this analysis every 10 or every 20 years. And, you would, and, and so they're constantly moving around the landscape. And then the last step would be in terms of what happens within the wares, now you start to design where the residuals are going to be. You agree that this, you're, you're, of what they're going to look like in the end. And the winds where you're not is where you're going to focus where you're going to get your most bang for your buck for your linear feature restoration activities. So this project actually is winding up and we should have some results within uh, about a month uh, to show that one, but preliminary results are suggesting that it's actually working out pretty well. Now one final thought um, in anticipation of somebody asking this question, how does a, an ecosystem-based approach, and I've only sort of shown you the tip of the iceberg here, how does an, uh, look, understanding how ecosystems work, how does that work with fine filter values? And the answer is it depends. What we did here is we ran a simulation exercise on the Alpac FMA um, for, to create the historical range of the landscape conditions that existed there. We overlaid those on top of the existing rules from Environment Canada from the 2011 report that say you have to, you know, linear features aside, okay? The first part of what Environment Canada says is you have to have at least 65% of your landscape in a recovered position, right? There's that bias again. Recovered means it hasn't been damaged by fire. So it has to be at least 40 years of age. Historically, on in northern, uh, in, in the, in the Alpac area, um, the Environment Canada requirements for caribou habitat were met 8% of the time. In other words, according to that rule, caribou shouldn't be there um, and uh, shouldn't be there and uh, weren't there in the past, which we know isn't true. And the best example of this actually is, is northern Saskatchewan right now, where they're not even close to meeting that rule and they're still counting caribou. So. Is a coarse filter or is a, a natural pattern approach, an ecosystem approach consistent with the needs of caribou according to the Environment Canada report? Obviously no. Is it consistent with the needs of caribou? Obviously yes, because they're there. Um, Northern Saskatchewan is one of the few areas in the West where they haven't been fighting fires um, over the last 50 years um, and they've got lots of caribou who are enjoying that habitat. So I would say that the lesson here is, and the, hopefully the point I'm making, taking a, a, a singularly issue-based fine filter approach and assuming that that is going to give us healthy landscapes is probably a risky thing to do. And there are already uh, entire provinces, this is, a, I, I like this quote from the Quebec Sustainable Forest Management Act, and that's law now, um, that says we are going to take this approach. And, and embedded within there, absolutely, are rules about what you do with endangered species, like caribou, and it's within there. But philosophically, this is their management foundation. Ontario has done the same thing. Saskatchewan's not very far away from doing the, from doing the same thing. Um, they're working on similar legislation. And I would say around the world, 
um, the number of agencies that are picking up on this and saying the species by species approach is killing us. And it started with the spotted owl actually in the Pacific Northwest. We've got to find a better way of managing for ecosystems and have our needs, our, our issues and values with, embedded within that. So with that, um, I hope that gives you an idea of, of what we do. Um, there's no rules or regulations about who can belong to the team. Most people just start to come to our meetings um, and eventually they give us money, but of course that's not necessary.